Well, hello there. Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com here for episode number 72 of Goulet Q&A. This is my weekly uh, video slash podcast that I do where I take your questions and answer at least some of them. I'm getting way more questions these days than I can answer, but I'm trying to pick the ones that I feel I can answer the best and that I haven't answered before. Um, interesting fact about the number 72, thought I'd throw that out there this week. Uh, number 72 in 1872, that was the founding of my alma mater, Virginia Tech. There's a little Virginia Tech thing I have right there. Also, the number 72 is the number edges in the great rhombicubactohedron. Google that and look at that thing. It looks pretty crazy. So, interesting little facts there. A uh, quick update before I get all into the questions. It's been a busy week, as always, here at Goulet. It's kind of just like the status quo around here. Um, we launched the Lilac Premiere. That's our seasonal uh, Edison Nouveau pen. It's uh, got an interesting little debate going on, especially on fa Facebook about, uh, you know, is this a pen that men can use or not? Because the color, it's not like last year's spring color, which was distinctly like hot pink. It's a purple and some guys are kind of standing up saying, hey, look, I'm a guy, this is a purple pen. I really like this. What do you want? I have one personally, so I would definitely say it could be a guy's pen, but you know, there's an interesting debate going on there, friendly debate, so maybe you can chime in on Facebook if you've got some opinions about it. But either way, that's our pen that we'll have for the next three months from Edison until we pick our summer pen. Um, we've also, uh, you know, did a blog post about the Lamy Safari Neon Lime, which is the special edition that'll be out for 2015 for the Safari. Um, you know, that one, people have some opinions too. It's like, why another green and not a purple? I totally agree, but uh, you know, hey, it's okay. It's, uh, I haven't seen the pen for myself yet. I won't really be able to make that determination. Uh, they are gonna be coming out with an ink that matches as well, which I've heard from people overseas that have started using it and blogging about it and stuff. It's kind of a light ink, almost like a highlighter. It's so light, um, but you know, I don't have it yet for myself, so I'll have to see once it comes in. The copper orange, uh, ink though is fantastic. So Lamy definitely nailed it with that one. And the lime one, we'll have to see. I don't know. Green can really be hit or miss when it comes to ink. Um, and the lighter it is, the harder it is to really get it right. So uh, they're trying though. They're trying. I appreciate that they're making the ink, so I'm not going to knock it until I try it. Uh, we got a record number of likes uh, on an Instagram post, which dethroned my personal what's in my bag as the record number of likes that we had on Instagram. So I'm a little sad about that, but I'm also not sad because our Instagram following is growing, a lot more activity, a lot of comments, a lot of engagement on Monday Matchup and all that. So we had a Monday Matchup post, which if you aren't familiar with Monday Matchup, um, you know, if you're just a YouTube follower, Monday Matchup is something that we post on the blog, but it's also something we do through Instagram. And we have a contest through Instagram as well, which you can win the pen and the ink. It's only on Instagram, so go check that out. But anyway, it's something we've been doing. Number 40 is what we did. We did the Lamy All-Star in Copper Orange with the Copper Orange ink really kind of cool. Caitlin from our customer care team did a phenomenal goldfish drawing with that. Looks really good. It's got over 700 likes on it now, which is a record for us. Hopefully it won't be a record for long though, because we keep on growing. So I know it kind of sets like a new expectation for like, oh dang it, like we're really, we're really putting out some good stuff lately. So we got to keep our game up. But at the same time, you know, not everything's going to be that, that dead on. So props to Caitlin for that and for the rest of our team for doing such a great job lately, especially on Instagram and YouTube and everything. We just, our media team's getting really solid. I'm really proud of our team and everything that we're able to do. Um, we also launched the new Regatta Sport in the Rose Gold Limited Edition. It's hard to miss this pen. I'm going to try zooming in here. We've got a new camera that we're trying out, so we'll see the zoom feature. It's a little bit slower than the old camera, but uh, the Rose Gold, it actually, you know, the stock pictures that we got for this pen made it look a little bit darker. It's pretty bright. It's like a very much like a penny copper kind of color. Um, so it's really kind of cool. Um, I dig it. It's got a black nib, the black carbon fiber. It is a limited edition, so it's actually numbered and has uh, out of 999, uh, so that's kind of cool. So props to Monteverde for continuing to come out with new stuff. They're always trying new things. Uh, the Regatta is like a love it or hate it kind of pen, very much so. I happen to love it. The magnetic cap thing is pretty cool. I've got a quick look video that I'm planning to put out for that pen, but shout out to that one for being new. Um, it is limited edition, but I don't think it's going to run out too quickly because, you know, it's a big, heavy pen. I don't know how much people are going to go nuts for it. But um, And then we got several new products that are going to be coming out. If you checked out our newsletter this week, lots of new things. The Kuwaiko All Sports Stone Wash. We've got um, some new Twisby pens that are coming out. The new, some new uh, all, 580 All Colors, like purple and then blue is going to be coming after that. The Midori Pan Am in blue, um, and then Quaco Skylines, those are going to be coming out too. So that's really kind of cool. 
lots of new stuff. But anyway, let's get right into the questions this week. Um, I got a few pen writing questions. First one I have is from Kerry Adams on Twitter. And the question was, what's the best way to get non-fountain pen users into the way of life without overwhelming them with all the options? And that is a great question because that's something I've been working towards for the last five years since I started this company. When I started out in fountain pens, the information was so scattered and it was so fragmented and it was hard to dig through forums and blogs and stuff like that to see, okay, what do I actually need to get started with fountain pens? You know, it's a very niche thing. It's got a lot of really cool aspects to the hobby that can be kind of overwhelming if you're first getting into it. It's just like any other somewhat technical hobby that can have a lot of variation to it. Um, it's hard to say like, what's the one pen that you can start out with? So I would say if you've got somebody like physically in your presence that you're trying to get into fountain pens, that's the easiest because you can actually take a pen and you can hand it to them and you say, okay, you hold it like this and try writing with it. Don't press hard, don't hold it up really high. You know, this is how you hold it and just write with it and just get them to experience the writing. That would be my first piece of advice. Don't get all into the prices and the ink and the technical stuff, how it works, all that stuff. Let them experience the good parts of writing with a fountain pen, seeing the different colors of ink, seeing how smoothly it can write, how smoothly it can flow. Those are the parts of the fountain pen that really kind of sell it and that, that personalization of the writing experience, different nib sizes, all that wonderful stuff. Let them experience that first without getting bogged down with, how do I clean this pen? Oh man, what do I need, a ball syringe? What is that, pen flush, who, what? You know, because there's a lot of new things that you can learn to enhance the writing experience, but it's not necessarily like required when you first get into it. The last thing I would say is try to show them my Fountain Pen 101 video series. I know it's a shameless plug, it is, but that's the reason I put that series together is so that you can understand the parts of a pen. How does a fountain pen work? How do you clean a pen? All those things, and I try to explain that in as basic a terms as I can while still giving very detailed information that gets you past that learning curve. There is kind of a steep learning curve to get to the point where you really just love fountain pens and can incorporate it into your lifestyle. Once you can traverse that learning curve and get to a point where you really have overcome the biggest hurdles, you can really enjoy your writing experience without getting too bogged down in the details. So that will help that quite a bit. But thank you, Carrie. That was a great question. Um, Dave or Bigger on YouTube. Hi, Brian. What's the best way to store spare nibs? That's a great question. I don't know that I've been asked that one before, at least I don't remember it. So that's kind of cool when I get like a completely brand new question. That's great. Um, so one of the things that I use and we actually use here at Goulet when we're shipping out spare nibs, whether it might be a Lamy or an Edison nib or something like that. I've got an Edison nib with a, a nib unit here. Um, and maybe I'll zoom in a little bit. Why not? I got a remote. Might as well. I'm not going to zoom in all the way because you'll, you'll get the idea. So I got an Edison nib housing here. Um, we actually store them in ink sample vials because these things are incredibly durable, incredibly tough. We'll hold up in shipping. You can carry them around, store them, put them in your desk drawer, whatever. Um, and what we found, you, you can just put it right in here, you know, especially if it's just going to lay in your desk drawer. You know, it's going to give it crush resistance and stuff like that. You're not going to lose it. So this would be very adequate. Um, but however, it's still going to rattle around a little bit. So if you really want to protect it well, um, one of the ways that we do that is we use just a small Ziploc bag like this. Um, we buy small ones. You may not have anything like that that's this small, but it really could be just about anything that you can kind of wrap it in. So you just wrap it in there, twist it up like this. Of course, I got to squeeze the air out of it. Okay. And then you can just stick it down in the vial. You know, if you're gonna be pulling this thing out every day, it might be a little bit of a pain to do that, but it does really help to kind of keep it in there. You can shake it around, it's never gonna move anywhere. Really is in there pretty solid, pretty inexpensive solution. If you've got a lot of nibs you're trying to store, it might be a little bit of a pain to do that, but you could just put some masking tape on here and write what nib it is and all that. And it's, you know, you would, you would get through some of that. And another thing that you could use, it's, you know, a little harder to come by, but I'm thinking like if you have a small like jewelry box that has um, you know, it's made for earrings or something like that, or just like a regular ring. You know, if you've just got one nib and you're trying to put it in somewhere safe, that could definitely work. Oh, zoom out too much. Zoom in a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> so that could definitely work. So that, that's what I have. There's probably a lot of other ways that you could store it. Um, I would be very curious in the comments if you have any particular ways that you store it and you'd like to share. I'd love to hear what you have. So that would be kind of cool. So shout out to me there if you've got any other options. Next question, uh, Peaches O on Facebook asked, will there be more OMAS offered at Goulet? 
thoughts on the OMOS 360 Mezzo? Um, well, I have never used the 360 Mezzo. I have used the 360 before, and it is a pretty cool pen. Um, I'm definitely open to carrying more OMOS. It is more expensive than all the other pens that we carry here, so it is a little bit outside of our normal you know, swim lane, if you will, in terms of pricing. Um, we have special ordered them. We have special ordered things like Pelican M800s and M1000s and stuff like that, but we don't really focus too much on kind of those upper echelon pens. We did do the Omas Ojiba Alba here in the last holiday season, and that pen went pretty successfully. We were able to properly represent some of the specialness of that pen, and I think that was a good fit. Um, that pen is a little lower price range than like the 360 and some of the other ones, so as we get higher and higher up into the prices, it gets a little bit harder because that's not really, really our focus uh, here at Goulet. Not that it couldn't be down the road, but it is kind of, um, you know, it's, it's taking away from, you know, some of the Monteverdes and Lamis and some of the other stuff that we uh, are typically kind of more known for. Um, that said, the pens are phenomenal, and I would love to get into them a little bit more. We have a lot of stuff in the in the works right now, so to do an expensive pen like that real justice is hard for us. So, like for example, they have the 360 or not the 360, the um, Art Italiana in London Smoke. Um, we had an opportunity to get involved in that one. It was very tough. I had the pen in my hand, and I was like, man, this is nice, but we have a lot of other things going on. I just can't focus on that and really do it justice right now, so I had to pass on that one. And it's interesting because the way that OMAS does things, they do a lot of limited edition things. So a lot of numbered things in very limited quantities. They get them, they have them for a couple of months, and then they're gone. So it's like if, if I don't have the bandwidth in my company to be able to really sh photograph it, shoot a video, do it justice, within the time frame that's needed for that pen, I've kind of missed that window. And that's what happened with London Smoke. I just don't have the time to commit to it. We're working on a lot of internal things. We've hired several people here recently, and we're working on some internal communication kind of stuff. We got 31 people here now, and that's um, you know a big challenge with trying to communicate and still operate like a small mom and pop when we have this many people. We are doing it, we're getting there, but it's requiring a lot of focus, so we are having to turn down some extra opportunities. And the OMAS pens is an opportunity we're having to say, you know what, we can do it if the timing is right, but we're not going to go all in on every OMOS pen until we really feel like we're ready to handle it, and right now we're just not. So um, we will look into them more, um, but uh, as for right now, we're just putting it on ice. Uh, next question is from Lisa G. This is a last pen writing question. Uh, Lisa G on Facebook said, which pens are best for lefties? Are there lefty specific pens or nibs? I see some kids like, uh, some kid pens, sorry, like Pelicano Jr. sold in left-handed version, but rarely regular pens sold this way. The reason to ask is that I'm a righty and I don't know what to look, uh, what to look for uh, for my lefty son. So that's a great question, Lisa. I totally empathize there. My son is five, so he hasn't quite gotten into writing stuff, but I'm thinking he's not a lefty though. Um, at least, actually, I'm really not 100% sure yet if you can even tell at that age. He does write everything with his right hand though, so I'm pretty sure he's a righty. Uh, but uh, anyway, my heart goes out to you. So I'm, I'm a righty as well. Whenever I've tried to write anything left-handed, you know, it looks like I've never written anything in my life. So I really can't I really don't have the refinement to tell the difference between any nib when I'm writing with my left hand. So from personal experience, I can't give any real judgment whatsoever. I have to rely completely on the feedback I get from uh, fans and customers that are lefties. Um, and some of the stuff that I've gotten is um, that, you know, there are different hand positions when you're talking about lefty versus righty. Um, the ones who tend to have the best uh, and the best time and the most options is what you call a lefty underwriter. And that's essentially just a mirror image of somebody who writes with their right hand. You know, it's typically, you've got your writing line here, which, uh, I don't know if I have a notebook that I can easily grab, but, um, you know, so I've got, a, I've got a notebook here, and I'm writing, and my hand is about in that position right there. So it's about 45 degrees from the writing line, and I'm just writing across like that. If you have a lefty that's writing in a mirrored position like that, uh, that's called an underwriter. Um, where you've got someone called an overwriter or hook-handed, that's when you're writing over top, where your hand is over the line that you're writing, and that gets really, really tough to have a 
a good writing experience with fountain pens. And please, if you're a lefty overwriter, please chime in on the comments here on YouTube or on the blog. I would love to know because again, personal experience doesn't, doesn't help me out here much. So please chime in if there's anything that I'm saying wrong. It could very, be, very well be possible. This is just my understanding from the many people I've emailed and commented with over the years. Um, overwriting is very much of a challenge. Some people like to have finer nibs not because it's a smoother or easier writing experience, but because it puts less ink down on the page and it's less of a tendency to smear if you're overwriting. Underwriting, it's not an issue because you're not moving your hand over cross of your writing. So then you can use finer nibs and it's not, it's, it's not quite as bad. It's also the position that your hand is in, you're not in quite as much of a push motion as you might be uh, when you're writing overhand. So that's really more of the issue is that you've got to put a little bit of ink down on the page and the finer the nib you go, the more scratchy it's going to feel. So there's always that balance as to what's, what's right. Um, the Pelicano Jr. left-handed nibs and Lamy has had a left-handed nib before. They're generally just medium nibs. There's nothing particularly unique or special about them except that they're just ground really smooth so that if you're writing in a push motion, it glides a little easier. That's about it. It's nothing too miraculous, which is why I don't think you see a lot of left-handed nibs around. It's just not, it, it, you know, the feedback I've heard on it is it doesn't really make that much of a difference necessarily. Um, and if you're writing underhanded, just going with a, a medium nib I think would be best because it's gonna be generally pretty smooth. Um, if you're writing overhanded like that, you're gonna have to play around a little bit more. I think going with something with a finer nib probably might be better just for the smear factor if nothing else. Um, but uh, I would say since you are, you know, I'm assuming you're already into pens yourself, you might have several different options hand some to your son and let him try out some different pens and really see what's best for him. I would start out with some medium nibs, maybe see if that works for him. If he's really having trouble with that, try going with finer nibs and see what works out best. Um, Lamy's got some good nib options. The Lamy ABC is a, is a kid pen that they have that's got what they call the A nib, which is a generally kind of smoothed out medium nib as well, which I think would probably also work well as a lefty and it's got kind of a triangular grip as well. So that might be another option for you to try out. Hopefully that helps you out there, Lisa. Um, the last thing, sorry, the last thing I wanted to say for you, Lisa, is, you know, if your son is young, one of the things that I hear from lefties is that, you know, the, the writing hand position really varies a lot with lefties, way more than righties. I don't know anybody who writes right-handed with their hand, like, hook-handed like that. It's very much a lefty kind of thing. And I think part of it is, you know, when the school desks and stuff like that, you have to accommodate all kinds of weird ways. Um, from what, I, what I've also heard is that a lot of teachers just don't know how to teach left-handed kids how to write, so the kids just end up doing whatever, uh, whatever works for them, and you end up with all kinds of crazy ways. Um, sorry, I don't mean that to be offensive or anything like that, but it, it, from everybody I've heard that's a lefty, if you're writing in kind of that underhanded position, that really is ideal um, in terms of writing with a fountain pen anyway. So if you are in the stage where you're teaching your son how to write, try to encourage him to write underhanded like that. It's going to make his life a little bit easier uh, down the road because he won't have smearing, whether he's using pencil or fountain pen, whatever it might be. Uh, next question I have is uh, an ink question. Just one ink question this week from Jonathan B. on Facebook. There are some who will not use Noodler's ink in pens above a certain price. What are your thoughts on this? Do you have a price threshold for Noodler's inks? You know, I got several Noodler's Ink questions this week, actually. Somebody asked me a Bay State Blue, and you know, well, Noodler's harm your pens, and I get those kind of questions all the time. Um, if you look on the Fountain Pen Network under the Inky Thoughts subform, you'll actually see there's like sticky threads in there about like, don't ask if Noodler's hurts pens anymore. Like the conversation has been beat to death. Um, the bottom line is like Noodler's Ink has a lot of different properties in some of their inks. So you can't generalize an entire brand, especially Noodlers, to say it will or will not harm your pens, or it will stain, or it won't stain, or it is permanent, or it isn't. The truth is it just varies from ink to ink. The vast majority of Noodlers inks are fairly conventional. They are a little saturated in color, so they have a lot of dye in them. So they're a little more maintenance to clean out sometimes. Um, and there are some inks like the base date ones, which are a little higher maintenance, require a little bit of knowledge, kind of knowing what you're getting into before you just go putting it in whatever kind of pen, that helps a lot. 
But what happens there is you get these extreme properties and stuff and then rumors start to spread and then everybody jumps on forums and starts to say just preposterous things like, you know, if you touch noodlers, it'll turn radioactive and blah, 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 just because it's funny. But then the rumors kind of start spinning out of control and you end up with millions of questions about like, you know, if I put base state blue on my Lamy pen, will it melt it? No. You know, it's just um, there are some instances that have happened because of some you know, hard to exactly nail down reasons, um, you know, specific to a certain anchor pen or whatever, and Noodlers gets thrown in there. I think part of it is because Nathan Tardif is, tends to be fairly conservative and fairly um, um, out there in terms of his political nature on some of his uh, ink labels and stuff like that. Some people may not like that, so they kind of jump on him for that, attack his inks maybe when it's political stuff that they really kind of disagree with. So the, the name kind of gets dragged through the mud at times, sometimes unjustly, um, sometimes not. But the bottom line is that you have to take it on an ink by ink basis. So depending on which Noodler's ink you're looking at, try to find some reviews, try to find some, whether it's product reviews on a website like mine or like actual like bloggers and stuff that have done review videos or blog posts or whatever that have actually used the ink that can give an opinion, um, you know, biased or not on whether or not they like that ink. Just try to be educated. And the bottom line is, you know, there's a lot of great inks out there. You don't have to use any one ink in your pen. So if you're ever questionable or not sure whether you should use a certain ink in your pen or not, just don't. You know, there's too many ink options. There's too many pen options for you to feel like you ever have to jeopardize any of your pens or anything like that. If you're not personally comfortable with it, don't do it. Um, but for me personally, um, you know, those are my thoughts. You're asking me if I have a price threshold for Noodler's inks. I don't. You know, for me, it's not about the price or anything like that. For me, it's more about the specific ink that I'm using. You know, there are definitely some. Base State Blue is definitely clingy. It tends to stain pens, though it cleans with bleach. Um, if you use a bleach diluted solution, like 10% bleach to water, that helps out tremendously. Bleach is what cuts it down, so it doesn't you know, permanently stain your pen. You just have to know what to clean it with. However, if I have it in an aluminum pen, you don't want to clean it with harsh chemicals and stuff like that. So those are the kind of things I take into account more. Is, um, and it's a little bit more of kind of an advanced thing. You have to know a little bit about the ink and the pen and the stuff that you're using. For me, it's more just like some of the pen, some of the inks that I know, such as Kung to Cheng, Base State Blue, things like that that are a little tougher to clean out, Whaleman Sepia. Um, those ones I will not use in certain types of pens like piston filling pens or lever filling pens that are a little tougher to clean out, that don't have an easy way to flush them through. I will avoid using those inks in those pens, but it's not really so much predicated on the price. So that's kind of where I stand. Make sense? All right, I got a couple of business questions. Um, first business question I have, this one is from Aditya S, forgive me if I say your name wrong, on Facebook. For Edison Production Line, is there any chance that you will ever offer seasonal editions? I really like the materials chosen for the Edison Nouveau Premier Seasonal Editions, but it's just too thin for extended use, and I would love to see something in the other pens, such as the Collier or the Herald. Um, well, that is certainly something that I could discuss with Brian Gray. I think we've had some light discussion on that in the past, um, but really it boiled down to he's really busy. It's kind of a challenge as it is just to get the seasonal premieres out, which is our exclusive Goulet pen um, that we have with Edison. So that is naturally what we would move towards doing an exclusive first, a seasonal one. Um, I did shoot him an email about that actually this morning, right after I uh, had your question. So I was like, hey, you know, we've kind of talked about this in the past. Is this something you would actually consider doing? Would you be able to handle? I haven't heard back yet. So, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have a firm answer for you. I would be inclined to think that he would be open to it um, if he could handle the, the production capacity. It is, um, it is something to consider because it, re it requires timeliness and requires, uh, you know, a bit of coordination of the ordering supplies and getting things out. Um, so th it is more work on his part especially and we have to choose all the colors we make several prototypes we look at the prototypes in person stuff like that so that is something certainly to take into consideration um, but I think that he might be open to it if I was 
going to choose one, I would probably choose the Collier um, because it's the most different from the Premier. Um, it's also a very popular style of pen um, that's nice and big and I think it would show custom materials really well. So that's what I would move towards, but I think it would be an option. So I'll ask and try to get a little bit firmer answer about that. Um, if we did do that though, I don't know how we would work that, if we would overlap it with the other Premier, or whether we would just do limited edition type things where it's like maybe once a year or twice a year. I don't know, I don't know. It would be interesting to talk about. So that's an interesting question. I, I appreciate you asking that. Uh, next one I have uh, is from Bianca M on Facebook. I missed the themed Q and A's. A week about paper, a week about flex nibs, a week about bound notebooks, and so on. I can understand why you moved away from brands as a weekly topic, but do you have any plans on bringing back themes? You know, I've talked about this, and uh, I kind of came to a compromise with you know, more categorizing the questions within each week. You know, I've got writing and paper and ink and all that um, business. You know, so I have moved a little bit towards theming, but we got such a variety of questions every week. The tough thing about theming them now is I don't know how I would do that and not ignore all the other great questions that we might have. The tough thing about theming, um, you know, when we started out theming, we had a lot of really good themes that we were able to do, but as we were kind of moving towards some more obscure themes, the amount of questions that I was getting was very low, and I would either have to supplement them um, or you stretch them out, you know, in terms of the content or, um, you know, the questions I didn't feel maybe were quite as strong, but I had to go with them because I just didn't have a lot of choices for that given theme. And it's always tough, like committing to a theme, not knowing the questions you're going to get in. So I think if I was going to move towards a theme, it might be better if I actually took it and did it after the fact. Like once we do the kind of themed for the for each week, like we're doing now, where there's different themes within the within the week. Um, maybe going back and doing a compilation, putting a compilation video of like, hey, here's a bunch of great paper questions. Here's a bunch of great business, you know, troubleshooting questions, whatever it might be. That might be easier doing more of a compilation style rather than committing ahead of time as to what the theme might be. But I don't know. I'm open to ideas. Just post something in the comments. I'm always open. I mean, the reason I do these Q&As is for you all. Um, I mean, as much as I love to just hear myself talk, which I really do sometimes, something I've learned to love over the years, but uh, after shooting all these videos. Uh, but you know, the reason I do these is for you. So I want them to be useful for you. If you'd like to do a theme, maybe I don't commit to doing a theme regularly, but if there's a theme that's just like really bubbling up and everybody's crying out for it, maybe we can do a special one week theme and then move back to the regular open forum. Uh, I'd be open to that. So, um, you know, I'm open to all ideas. Honestly, I'm a pretty flexible guy. Um, next question I have. Uh, Pavel V on Facebook asked, what cartridge has the largest ink capacity? I mean, which company does make the ink cartridges with the largest ink capacity? I need a load of ink and cartridges are a safe variant for me. Ah, I don't know why I put this under the business one. I probably should have put this under ink. But anyway, maybe it was. I just put it in the wrong place. But anyway, it has a question, I guess, about business you know, pen, ink businesses, whatever. Uh, but anyway, okay. Probably in the wrong place, but whatever. We'll keep it here, Pavel. So uh, I would say that the largest ink capacity, the standard international long cartridge, which is the only one that I actually have, like, convenient and handy, is pretty long. It's about twice the ink capacity of a normal standard international cartridge. So you're going to get, you know, a mil and a half, maybe a little bit more, um, 1.7, 1 1.8. I haven't specifically measured that one out. Um, the Waterman cartridge is pretty long. Aurora is, is pretty long. Parker has a pretty long cartridge as well. Those are the ones that are coming to mind as the largest ink capacity that I can think um, Lamy has got a pretty decent ink capacity on theirs. Um, the rest of them are all fairly similar. The standard international short, you know, this little guy, which is probably the most recognizable one, um, is actually probably one of the smallest ink capacities that are out there. Um, but in general, that would be it. Um, but the thing that I don't like about all of those cartridges is the color options are very limited. Um, the standard international short has probably the most of any fountain pen ink cartridge. It definitely has the most of any fountain pen ink cartridges in terms of color options. The long, though, there just aren't that many companies that make it in the long. So you're going to be pretty limited in terms of your color options there. Um, and then obviously like Waterman, Aurora, Parker, Lamy, those are all proprietary cartridges. So you're only going to get those inks 
available in those cartridges, generally speaking. Monteverde does make some Lamy compatible cartridges and things like that. So Monteverde is really trying to get into the game um, as far as ink goes and ink cartridges and stuff. Um, another option for you though would be, um, you know, for those ones that have limited color options, would be to get their cartridges and then refill them with an ink syringe and you can use whatever ink you want. So you get the large ink capacity, but you get the advantage of using whatever bottled ink that you want. So I have a video on that, Fountain Pen 101, refilling an ink cartridge. You can go and check that one out. All right, I got a paper question this week. Um, this question is from Landon G on Facebook. Hey, Brian, love what you do. Well, thank you, Landon. Uh, I'm left-handed and I'm having trouble finding a good notebook with paper that isn't super ink resistant, but also not super absorbent. I suffer from ink smearing as you'd guess, but like 90 gram cotton paper, is there an alternative? Um, yes, so I can really only speak to the paper that I have. There's probably a lot of other options. You know, I tend to move more towards the very ink resistant papers because that's what works best with fountain pen inks. As soon as you get away from the really ink resistant ones, then brands and all kind of stuff, there's so many options out there for it just in general for notebooks and all that because you get into just kind of any notebook can make kind of a middle of the road paper in terms of absorbency. It's a lot harder to make a really nice paper. Um, and that becomes much more kind of a premium product that a boutique seller like myself would be more inclined to carry. The Rodias, the Claire Fontaines, the Gilalo, you know, all that kind of stuff. So when you get away from those, it becomes a lot more muddy. So I have a lot of notebooks that are leaning more towards the ink resistant side, but aren't, aren't absorbent really. They're not quite Rhodia Clairefontaine. So I would say try the Filofax notebooks that we recently picked up. Those are those are good, a little more absorbent. Uh, Leuchtturm as well is kind of in that range. Um, Apica, Midori, and Banded Apple. All of those are pretty ink resistant, not as much as Rhodia Clairefontaine. There are definitely going to be a lot of options in terms of format and line ruling and color and stuff like that within those. Those are most of these are bound notebooks we're talking about here. So um, not quite as many options as you'd have within a, especially Claire Fontaine, but check those ones out. Um, and then also we have a paper sampler, a notebook sampler. Um, it's not sheets of paper, but it's actually whole notebooks. So it's not super cheap, but a lot of the notebooks that I just named are in that sampler. So if you didn't want to go hunting and pecking around for all different formats and stuff, you could get that sampler. We take the basically the smallest and least expensive option of notebook in all of these brands and put them in that sampler to make it easier for you to test out which you might like. So hopefully that helps you out. And then I'm gonna wrap it up here with a couple of troubleshooting questions. First troubleshooting question I have is from Ty W on Facebook. What makes Jerbon write great in my Schaefer 100, but private reserves skip a lot? More broadly, what makes one ink company different from another in terms of how they write? Um, I definitely could have put this one under the ink category, but you're specifically asking about some troubleshooting. So Jerbon versus private reserve, I'll talk about that one first. Schaefer 100, pretty middle of the road pen in terms of flow, in terms of um, nib, nib performance and stuff like that. So there's nothing too crazy going on with your pen. Um, so the ink definitely is more of your factor here. J I'll say JR Bond in general, they um, use lesser saturated ink colors. I don't know exactly which ink you're talking about here, so it can be a little tough. JR Bond does have some inks that certainly have some more um, caveats that need to be had with them, like the Rouge Hematite, the Stormy Gray, those are different than the rest of the Jerobon line. But in general, the Jerobon, just the normal line, the non 1670 line, pretty conventional inks, no permanence or waterproofness to worry about, pretty easy to clean, smooth flow. They are really minimalistic in terms of the stuff they put in their ink. They don't use all kinds of crazy chemicals or biocides or any of that kind of stuff. So it's gonna smooth, it's gonna flow pretty smoothly in your pens which is why a lot of people like them. Generally, the less saturated an ink, the more smoothly it might flow. Now, it's not the only factor, but that's generally you know, uh, a big factor. Um, Private Reserve is kind of the other end of the spectrum. It's very saturated with dye. It's, uh, you know, the American brands, Private Reserve and Noodlers, have a lot of saturation to them. So they have a lot of dye content in that ink pretty much as much as it'll handle. Um, so very bold colors, very vibrant, but at the same time, dye is drier than water when it flows through the pen. So it 
um, it tends to flow a little, uh, not quite as easily. So they add lubricants and stuff like that in there to try to counteract that, and some pens handle that better than others. So it could literally just be that your Schaefer 100 doesn't flow quite as well with your particular private reserve as it does with your particular um, Jerobon. Now, I just said earlier in the Q&A that you can't always generalize an entire brand you know, especially noodlers, but even like a J.R. Bond or a, a private reserve, it's hard to generalize the characteristics of an entire brand of ink because there are different properties in one or the other. So I am having to speak very broadly here, and I'm sorry for that because I don't know exactly which inks you're dealing with, but that is kind of the bigger factor. Um, the pen is always a factor. The paper is also a factor. But the ink, the, the degree of saturation of the dyes and the amount of lubricants they add in there really kind of make the difference and because you have different nibs you have different feed systems and stuff like that on every pen those inks will counteract and enact differently with those pens in in certain combinations there's so many variants that it's hard to say with certainty which one will perform or won't perform better or worse with another so that's where you really have to experiment and honestly that's the whole reason really why we do ink samples here at Goulet because we have the swabs, which are digitally on the website, and you can't always tell in person. That's part of why we do samples, but also it's because there's nothing like getting to try your pen, your ink in your hand on your paper. There are so many factors. Even honestly, like I've talked about this before, but I'll mention it again. You know, the way that you hold your pen and the writing pressure and your speed and everything um, really makes a difference in terms of how well your pen flows also. So you, the ink is one factor for sure, but I will write with my pen and it looks nice and dark and flows well. Rachel um, holds her pen much more upright and she doesn't write as, as with as much pressure as I do. So her ink looks much lighter and she can have problems with skipping on certain pen and nib combinations, whereas I don't. So that's another factor to throw in there. It's the, the beauty and the frustrating part about this hobby is that you can personalize your writing experience so much, but it can take a little bit of experimentation to find out exactly like what is right for you. And the last question I have for this week, this is from Poe L on Facebook, another troubleshooting one. If I inked up a large capacity pen, which means I will not use up the ink in a short period, do I still need to clean my pen regularly? Um, yeah, you know what, I think so. Um, and by regularly, I mean like once a month, right? Um, so if you're talking something like a piston filling pen, you know, that has like upwards of a milliliter and a half or two milliliter ink capacity, if you're not, you know, if you've got that pen in your rotation, you got a 10 pen case, whatever, you're using it maybe once, you know, every few days or maybe even once a week. You know, if you're writing with that pen for five minutes once a week, you know, first of all, do you need to have that many pens inked up? You might say, no, I usually do. So, you know, I totally feel where you're coming from. I'm actually in the middle of a pen cleaning blitz right now because I have about 40 different pens that I had set aside that I was like, oh, I need to clean that out. Well, I'll just use a different one and clean it later. That becomes a problem. <laughs> that becomes a problem, especially if the pen is not as inked up like your situation. And it's like, there's just a little bit of ink left in there and you set it aside for a month or two and it kind of dries out. And then it's like, dang it, now when I clean it, I need to do a full on like, you know, industrial cleaning, take the whole thing apart and all that. And it's like, why do I continue to put it in that position? Proactivity really helps a lot when you're cleaning pens. It can make the difference between cleaning a pen in five minutes and cleaning a pen in 30 minutes. Um, so if you wait too long, then you can really make a lot more work for yourself. So it's a lot better to try to catch it earlier on. So I personally like to clean a pen, or I like to say that you should clean a pen. Don't always live it out myself because I, you know, have a lot of pens and have kids and the business and all this stuff. So I don't always necessarily practice what I preach, but I hope I always still preach it. It's always best to clean a pen that you're using regularly. If I say regularly, I mean like not dried out and crusty and sitting aside. One that has ink and is you're just using the same color ink in it, whether you're refilling it or just leaving one filling in it and sitting like that, I say go a month and then clean the thing out, ideally. You don't have to live by that. Some pens will seal up really nicely and can go longer than that. Other pens, maybe not so much, so you wanna kinda of play that one by ear. 
But um, when, you, uh, when you're using a pen like that and you're cleaning it out at least once a month, it's going to make your life a little bit easier than if you let it completely dry out. And the thing is, the reason you're doing that is because um, ink is made mostly of water, water and dye and some other stuff. So when you're leaving it sitting there, even if it's sealed up, you know, it's maybe not sealed 100%. So when you're leaving it for a month or more, the water can start to evaporate out of that ink. And then you're left with a more concentrated dye that won't flow as well through the pen. And uh, if it's left there for long enough, or there's a very little bit of ink left in there, the dye and everything can actually dry out and leave you know, this crustiness inside your pen that's really tough to clean out. Um, not that it can't be done, and you can always use something like a pen flush or whatever to help uh, revive your old crusted pens. Uh, but in general, that's what I would say is better to do it within a month. Uh, of course, you always want to clean out your pen every time you're changing an ink color. It doesn't have to be a super thorough one, but if you're just using a, using a color and you want to change it out, just flush it out you know, until it's clear. Touch a paper towel to the nib. Make sure there's no color coming out of the nib, and if there's no color, you're in good shape. You can ink it up with a new color. Good to go. Um, but in general, that's, that's what I like to say that you should do. However, it's, you know, use your own judgment. If you're using a pen, if you've got it inked up, it's a two milliliter ink capacity and you're, you're using it and you, a month goes by and, you ink it, and you're still using it and the ink level doesn't look like it's dropped and it still flows really nicely, do what you want. You know, it's your pen. Um, so I would say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But in general, it's a good idea to try to clean it out pretty regularly. All right, so that's going to be it for this week. I know a little bit shorter than usual, perhaps. Maybe that's good for you. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, but, but that's what I got this week. So um, be sure to ask me some questions for next week. I've um, been getting a lot of them. Uh, Margaret and I are really looking. Margaret's uh, helping me monitor Facebook more and more these days. So you may have seen more activity on Facebook. Madigan's helping out on Twitter, Instagram. Margaret's helping out on Facebook, Pinterest. Um, so they're kind of tag team and divide and conquer a little bit. And I'm kind of chiming in here and there wherever I can and I'm able. Um, but uh, Margaret's been helping out, helping me answer more of your Q&A questions. Since most of them come through Facebook, she's been going back and answering yours um, that I haven't gotten to. So we're trying to do that. We're trying not to leave you completely high and dry. I know I've got a bunch of questions that I have kind of committed to going back and answering that I haven't been able to because it's been kind of crazy for me lately with everything I've had going on. Got some personal stuff going on too that I've been working through. but. You know, we're trying. That's all, we're, that's all we can say is we're trying. We're giving it the old college try. Um, but the question of the week that I have for this week that I would love to hear from you about is, um, you know, what are your thoughts on ink cartridges? You know, I had a question earlier in the Q&A about ink cartridges, you know, short ones, long ones, whatever. Um, you know, we do have, oh, something I forgot to mention altogether. We're going to be having the um, diamine 30, uh, 30 mil bottles, so a little bit smaller bottles, and we're going to have diamine ink cartridges in select colors. They don't offer the full range, but we got some of the more popular ones. Um, so we're, we're expanding slowly into more ink cartridges. Um, and it's something that I personally don't love ink cartridges. You know, they're convenient at times. I do use them in certain situations, uh, but they, you don't have the same color range as you have in bottles. Now that we're getting into private reserve ink cartridges and we got some diamine ones, we're getting into some of the better colors, I think, um, in ink cartridges. So I'm getting a little more excited about that. But I would love to know what you think about ink cartridges. Do you love them? Do you hate them? Do you use them? Which ones do you like? Does it factor into whether you buy a pen or not? I'm just very curious to know. So that'll be the question of the week for this week. Um, answer that on YouTube or on the blog uh, or on Twitter. What the heck? Tweet it out. I don't know. However you want to talk to us, we're there. Um, so I appreciate all of your interaction there. I've really been feeling the love from everybody lately um, on YouTube, on the blog, on Instagram for sure on Facebook. So shout out to everybody out there in the Goulet Nation, if you will. Totally stole that from Gary V, the Vayner Nation, but Goulet Nation, I don't know. I don't know if you want to be called anything. It sounds kind of weird and narcissistic to put my own name in like that, but what the heck. Um, anyway, so I hope you have a great week. Hope you enjoyed this Q&A. Have a wonderful weekend, a great rest of the week. Be sure to check out some of this new stuff we got going on. Engage with us, ask some questions for next week. And as always, right on.